So now we hit the, the ending session. Uh, so we just have two more talks. Magda and myself, if you want to count me. Uh, Magda Balazinska is a professor at the University of Washington. Um, so this category is listed as students. Um, it's not technically Mike students in the official sense that maybe like, you know, Margo, Mike Olson is. It's students that have worked with Mike here uh, while he's been at MIT. Um, go, Magda, go. Does someone turn it on? Oh, okay, thank you. All right, thanks everyone. So um, actually a few weeks ago, Sam emailed me and says, hey Magda, do you wanna say a few things about what it was like to work with Mike when you were a student here? And I thought, you know, boy, where do I even begin? Um, and then I actually remembered, I do have tenure, which as some people have pointed <laughs> out, that means I actually can say uh, what I wanna say. <laughs> But the truth is that, and I'm going to start on a serious note, is that uh, really Mike is just an awesome, awesome uh, role model for all of us. And he's a role model, I think, from many, many different perspectives. And this is, you know, honest truth. Uh, so first, of course, as we have seen throughout the day, he has great vision and great technical skills. So we all, you know, aspire to be, uh, to be Mike. Uh, and this is not always easy. So I did try. I did purchase a lot of red shirts. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, finally, what totally blocked me is I could never find shoes with high enough heels. Uh, so I had to give up on trying to be Mike and instead maybe try to just be a little bit like Mike. So if you think about it, if Mike has 100 startups, maybe the rest of us can you know, have one startup. Uh, if Mike has this never-ending stream of successful uh, systems, maybe the rest of us can build a few of these systems or maybe at least you know, write papers that talk about these systems. <laughs> Uh, and if Mike can have an impact on the world, maybe the rest of us can try to have an impact on some, you know, at least some small community. But that's not one, that's not the only reason why uh, Mike, to me, I think is a great role model, is that, as we have seen today, so you know I'm not lying, is that he really truly cares about everyone around him. So when Mike came to MIT, I mean, I knew he was famous because I had heard of Ingress before, even though I was at MIT. Uh, and we didn't <laughs> talk about databases. <laughs> So he was super famous, and I expected that as a famous person, he would spend his time doing whatever famous people did, which I didn't know what it was, but clearly important stuff. And instead, Mike would always be available to read our write-ups. And as Mike remembers, at that time, I would lie, write long write-ups. And he would always read them, which was very surprising. And he would always say things like, this person is up for tenure, so we need to all work hard and make sure that this person does whatever they need to do to get tenure. This person is graduating, and he kept talking about everyone on the team and really worrying about uh, making sure that everyone would have the most successful career pos possible, and that was really uh, inspiring. The third thing is that he really cares about the database community. Uh, and that really shows. And I actually was not in the database community, and actually thanks to Mike, I moved into the database community. And one thing that I truly uh, love about our community, and I think today's a good example, is that it's just an awesome place with so many really nice people. And I was thinking, why is that? And I think a big part of the reason is because Mike, David, Jim Gray, when he was here, and other people who are senior people in our community are just amazingly nice, and that really sets the tone for, for the rest of us. And finally, as you have seen, just Mike never gets tired, something that I have not yet managed to accomplish, but uh, maybe one day. But of course, you will say it's easy to say nice thing about someone in the abstract, so uh, let me give you a few concrete anecdotes of um, what it actually uh, was like to work with Mike, and in particular, what we learned from Mike. So as background, let me tell you what life was like before Mike showed up. So I was uh, here as a graduate student in systems, working with a great guy, Harry Balakrishnan, who was my advisor until I graduated. And we were working on a lot of really cool stuff. Many of you will recognize them. Uh, not that we contributed the most, but because they were hot topics uh, at that time. So we were working on peer-to-peer. -peer. How many of you have seen the peer-to-peer -peer ring with all those things around the circle, right? Yeah, many of us. So we, we kept seeing those you know, peer-to-peer -peer rings all over. We were uh, working with uh, sensors, with uh, resource discovery, with intentional naming, sending messages around, discovering devices online, et cetera, et cetera. And there was even one part that was using kind of XML-like semi-structure things, and we were all excited about it. And then, well, then came Mike. <laughs> uh, and it all changed, especially, I don't know how many of you know how Mike likes XML. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that part of the project, I was actually really proud of it and really happy. And we were not sure with Harry where to uh, send this work to. And I looked online as a student, and I found this conference called SIGMOD. And I said, this looks really great. And Harry said, let me talk to Mike. And then Harry came back and said very gently, you know, Mike, that these database people, they don't seem to really like this XML kind of stuff. Uh, so that was, uh, that was the end of it. Uh, we did publish it somewhere else, though. But there was one part of the work that was really exciting as a shared um, uh, potential project, where this whole sensor stuff and the streaming work that was uh, going on at, um, uh, with the Aurora project. So we started to work with stream processing, in particular distributed stream processing. So Harry and I were thinking publish, subscribe, messages, peer-to-peer, -peer, distributed. And then when we had a meeting with Mike, it was a culture shock. Because when we raised you know, the issue of distributed data management, Mike would always talk about these employees in San Francisco and his <laughs> employees in New York. And he even cared about his employees in other countries that were actually apparently paid a net salary with lunch allowance, where the American employees. <laughs> And I thought, gee, database people really do care about employees. <laughs> but of course, after all this laughing, whenever I'm teaching in class and I have to talk about distributed databases, guess what example first comes to my mind? Uh, so that was one thing. The other thing we learned from Mike, very, very important, is that everything is best seen from 100,000 feet. Uh, <laughs> And actually, this is great. Whenever I'm stressed about the project, I look at it from 100,000 feet. I look at the you know, video of the universe, and I'm thinking, you know, my problem is really not that big of a problem. However, when I'm trying to debug some code, uh, it's kind of hard at 100,000 feet. The other great thing when Mike came, and some people mentioned it, is that we engaged in these uh, collaborations uh, with different people around the country in all these exotic locations. And I was really excited. I came from Montreal into the wild America. And then here I go. I was supposed to go on a business trip to Providence. <laughs> I was very excited. I still remember. I came home and told my husband, uh, Michael, on Thursday, I'm going to go to Providence for a you know, meeting with these people from the uh, Brown University. And he's like, Providence, where is that? And we lo looked it up on the map and said, oh, holy moly, there's a whole state down there. <laughs> so that was very exciting. Uh, we also got to go to Brandeis, a university I did not know existed. And I discovered the main quality of Brandeis University. So Mitch is here, and he probably knows what's the most important quality of Brandeis, that there's actually a lot of parking. <laughs> so whenever we had to have a meeting for the Aurora Borealis team, we would most often meet at Brandeis because we could all park, which we could not do at Brown, and we could definitely not do at MIT. And finally, kind of one of the really, really important things we learned, of course, <laughs> is we learned all about quad charts. But because we were Mike's graduate student, he told us the secret of a successful quad chart, a secret that I'm going to now share with you. And it goes as follows. <laughs> and that works for all the papers. If you want to write a paper, that's the way to do it. And finally, something that actually ca uh, came up today more often than, uh, than I expected is, of course, that uh, Mike gives very, very frank advice. And I have a few of those quotes. All of them are true quotes that he actually said in front of me. Uh, so the first one is, uh, you know, as a faculty, if uh, we do a project with a student and we don't get the results that we expected, I will typically say, this approach is not really working out, you know, as well as we uh, anticipated. Versus Mike just says. <laughs> um, similarly, when a student is giving a practice talk, we say, you know, you have to engage with the audience. You have to have presence. Maybe you should move around a little bit. Versus Mike says. <laughs> uh, and finally, you know, when uh, uh, let's say we're going to, uh, to do some work uh, and we're going to give a demonstration, we might come to a student and say, look, our group got a demonstration into SIGMOD, and I know it's just a few weeks away, but maybe we can add this new system we've been building and add it to the demonstration and go to SIGMOD and actually show it off in the same uh, demo booth as you want, versus Mike simply comes up to you and says, SIGMOD is next week, you should just go and give a demo. <laughs> Uh, but I think kind of the last, probably the most important thing uh, that happened is uh, Mike helped me graduate. And this is a true story. It, was, uh, it happened as follows. 
So one day Mike came to my office and says, Mike, now you should graduate this year. And I thought, oh, good, this is good. So I thought about this, and I remember that night I was working hard, working late, and I started to, to doubt that. And I emailed Harry, and I said, Harry, you know, I actually don't think I'm ready to graduate this year. And Harry replied, I think you are ready, but if you are more comfortable, you can stay one more year, I'm supportive, I will provide you an array, etc., etc." And I replied to Harry, yeah, you know, I really think I would rather stay uh, one more year. And about 10 minutes after I had sent this email to Harry, uh, I saw an email from uh, Mike, not addressed to me, addressed to everybody else, copying me, saying, Magda is graduating, where should she send her CD? <laughs> But overall, thanks, Mike. All right, so you're finishing up with me. Uh, it's been a long day, but we're almost done. Um, so I'm going to keep my talk short. Uh, a lot of you have talked about you know, what's it like to write, uh, sorry, what's it like to work with Mike, uh, have meetings with him. Apparently, he doesn't write any code. Uh, but uh, Magda talked about what's it like sort of be collaborating with him. And I want to spend some time talking about what's it like to actually write papers with Mike. Um, and just so we're clear, I, officially, I was Stan's anonymous uh, student at Brown. Uh, but Stan was always there. He's on my thesis committee. And he helped me out with a lot of things. Um, Stan taught me about other aspects of life uh, that <laughs> beyond databases. Whereas before I talk about my time in grad school, uh, before that, I did what, what you would call, uh, as, as Joe said, a pre-doc uh, with Marone Livney uh, in the University of Wisconsin uh, on the Condor project. And when I was there, it was sort of right at the moment uh, that uh, DeWitt was going to leave for Microsoft, and Raghu had already left for Yahoo Research. Um, and so people at the time we were talking about in our group, there was this legend of like Mike Stonebreaker. And it was always described in the context uh, being compared to David DeWitt, right? So Mike Stonebreaker's projects, Ingress, Postgres, Illustra, all these companies that he sort of formed out were much more successful than David DeWitt's, right? Um, <laughs> the students that Mike Stonebreaker had were much more successful than David DeWitt's students, right? Margot Seltzer, uh, Mike Olson, uh, Jerry Held, all those guys. Um, and then it was also being described as he's very, very tall. You know, DeWitt's a tall guy, uh, but people were describing Mike Stonebreaker as being even taller. And there was other weird things that like, things like that. Um, I don't have any comment on that. Um, so, and so, all right, this is kind of crazy, right? But, you know, it sort of, people kept embellishing, it kept bigger and bigger. And then uh, when it was time to decide to go to grad school, the last winter at Wisconsin that I was there, it was like negative 20 for like two weeks. And I'm like, all right, I, I got to get out of here. And I decided to come to Rhode Island in New England and work with Stan or at Brown. And I just so happened to be lucky to show up at the right time when HDOR was getting started. They're like, hey, we need grad students to work on this project. Uh, and I was taking Stan's class at the time. He's like, are you Andy Pablo? I said, yes. He said, well, David DeWitt says I should talk to you. You should come work on HDOR with us. And so we went, uh, met up at MIT. Uh, with a bunch of other grad students as well, and I met Mike for the first time, and yes, he wasn't that impressive. He was very tall. Um, but what was really shocking about it was how much of a pussycat he was. He was kind of like this lumbering giant, very friendly, not as all as intense the way that David DeWitt was, right? Totally opposite. <laughs> so, um... Don't have tenure yet. <laughs> I have a nine year I got a nine year ten o'clock. You forget all this, don't worry. Um, all right, so there's been two people in my life uh, that I've written papers with that uh, have just really blown my mind about how incredible they are. Um, Stan is very good, but Stan actually didn't write too many, like, you know, write paragraphs and things like that. He would always sort of edit my work because he felt that I was you know, far and off as a writer that he didn't really need to like babysit me and do all these things. So I've collaborated with a bunch of other people on papers, um, and the two that really stand out as being the most impressive was, first was Sam Madden. Um, Sam is like the, the, the tooth fairy of paper writing, right? So like to say the paper is sort of like a quarter done, you put it underneath your pillow, and then when you wake up, Sam has written the entire rest of the paper for you, right? <laughs> 
And then, of course, the other person is Mike Stonebreaker, right? I don't know how Mike does it at, uh, at this point of his life, but he just cranks out so much, uh, so, so, so much writing in it. And, but the key difference between Sam and Mike is when Sam writes a bunch of, pa- uh, you know, bunch part of the paper for you, it's almost perfect. It's gold, right? It's, it's polished. It's wonderful. You don't really need to edit it that much. Whereas with Mike, it's, uh, it's, it, it needs a bit more work, right? So he knows how to cut through all the garbage and all the hyperbole and get to the point that you're really trying to get, you know, focus on in the paper, and that he gets right. And like I said, he can write a lot, a lot of paper, a lot of material in a short amount of time. Um, but Mike Olson sort of alluded to this earlier. He's weirdly obsessed with this, with this one word that appears <laughs> nonstop through his papers, right? And that's the word hence. <laughs> And it's good to know that like, this isn't like an age thing. Apparently, he's been doing this for years and years and years, right? So just to give you an example, so this is a paper uh, that Mike and I were working on actually this summer. Uh, we actually submitted it to SOCC, but it was rejected, but it was later submitted to something else. So this is uh, before my edits. This is sort of the first version, the first draft that Mike set around to the group, said, hey, here you go. So now I just want to highlight where all the henses are, right? <laughs> Uh, there's another example that I couldn't find where I'm, I'm pretty sure it might have been the Matt Reduce stuff, where he used the word hence three times in one paragraph, right? Um, which is uncanny. But just to point out here, so like he's got, it's on average, he's about two henses per pages. Except for the second to last page, he only has one hence, but he doubled down on the last one. He got, a, he got that extra one in order to make up for it, right? So uh, I'm not going to say much more about Mike's writing abilities because he and I are still working on papers together. and as David DeWitt obviously pointed out, I need to get tenure uh, in nine years. Um, So I'll say that I'm very, very grateful to have worked with Mike in my time here in grad school. Like, it was very unexpected uh, to have a chance to work with a man that this great caliber and this great uh, experience. And like I said, no matter whether you're a new grad student or whether you're, you know, Margo or Mike or Olson or something like that, he treats pretty much everyone the same, right? And I think that's really great. Um, And I really appreciate it with that. So now where I'm at, basically, since I've graduated, and I've moved to Pittsburgh, I still have a chance to work with Mike, which is very great. Um, but the problem is, um, he's a tall man, both figuratively and physically. And in the database community, he casts a wide shadow. So I'm under a bit of a distress, because I'm like, yes, I like working with Mike, but then again, I need to get tenure, so I sort of have to branch out and do my own thing. So that's, I haven't figured out how to do that just yet, but that's, that'll come down in the future. So that's all we got to say about writing with Mike. Okay, um, next, uh, so there was, um, uh, when we were organizing this, obviously, you know, Mike, Mike has a lot of impact on a lot of people, but they have not, you know, some people that are in Europe, uh, or some people in California and other places were not able to make it today. So we sent out a call for participation to have people send in video clips of themselves, you know, wishing Mike happy birthday and things like that. So um, I'm gonna show that now. Um, And then we'll talk about the quiz results, and then we'll have the open mic afterwards. Hi, Mike. Happy birthday. I feel really lucky to have had you as a mentor early in my career. Um, Happy birthday, Mike. Uh, Really enjoyed working with you on both Streambase and Vertica. Uh, You are an exceptional entrepreneur, a brilliant technologist, and a stubborn, shall we say steadfast, visionary. Um, Happy birthday. 
I met Mike Stonebreaker uh, at the High Performance Transaction Processing Workshop uh, at Asilomar, California in 2001. At the time, I was uh, a first-year assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, I was sitting with my laptop uh, looking at uh, the slides that I had, uh, trying to decide whether I should go up there and give a talk or not. It was a gong show session, the one that uh, invites impromptu talks. And um, Mike sat next to me. Uh, we were drinking port wine uh, in these evening sessions. And Mike sat next to me with his glass of port. And we got to talking. And he said, um, you, should, you should go and give a talk. Um, I mean, I was already thinking a little bit about it. But the fact that Mike said it made it a necessity. So I started putting together the slides. And at some point, Mike, who was watching over my shoulder, took my computer and started changing the slides. Uh, putting you know, throwing away stuff and, and uh, moving things around and he gave me the computer back and said okay now go give the talk i was so overwhelmed i will never forget it i went up there and gave you know i don't know if it was because of the port wine or it was because mike stonebreaker had just you know refurbished my slides for me i gave probably the best talk of my life that five minute little poster session Ever since Mike has been a great mentor and a great, very honest friend. And thank you, Mike, for everything. Happy birthday. Mike, it's a real pleasure to wish you a happy birthday today. It's been nearly 30 years since we first met. And I think it was at Wisconsin in front of a white food and we were asking me about triggers, lingens, all the good stuff and how those turn out to be these. Uh, work was going to apply to it. <laughs> Looking back over those 30 years, it's just amazing to me. The energy, the leadership, and just the patience you've shown in taking problems of great technical interest, practical importance, not to mention translating them into one startup after another. You've been a little dynamo and an inspiration, not just to one of us, but to all of us. So, happy birthday. Enjoy it. Take care. The mic barometer. So in your, if you're in a meeting with Mike and you see him slowly slide down because he's getting bored and more bored with the speaker or the topic or whatever, when his head reaches about the top of the table, watch out. There's a storm coming because he'll get so bored he'll say, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. And you can say you have to Happy birthday, Mike. Hi, Mike. This is Donald from Zurich. I'm really sorry that I cannot be with you in person today. Nevertheless, I would like to congratulate. I hope that you're enjoying the big day for the big guy of big data. I'm glad that you're taking the day off in order to celebrate rather than work. Your competitors in industry and academia really appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, I wish you all the best, and I'm looking forward to continue working with you on CIDA and all of these exciting opportunities in these great days. Have a great day, and bye. Hi, Mike. Here's wishing you a belated happy birthday. Uh, we've known each other for 39 years now, since um, Sigma 1975, when, if I recall correctly, you were waiting for a tenure decision, um, and I was trying to finish a PhD thesis. Um, it was almost a rather short friendship when you nearly broke your neck riding Ed Lazowska's bicycle down a steep hill one summer um, at UC Santa Cruz when we were both doing short courses there in the late 70s. But um, I guess your biking skills have improved since then, um, since you seem to do fine on a cross-country bike trip with Beth many years, many years later. Um, on a more serious note, I'd like to thank you for all your effort to promote the importance of database management to the computer science community, um, and for all your groundbreaking projects that continue to push us all in new and important directions. It's been a real pleasure and an honor knowing you. And for both our sakes, I'm looking forward to another 39 years 
of friendship. So all my best. Happy 70th. Oh, Mike Stonebreaker. Yeah, I've known Mike for years. He and I go way back together. Mike used to come down from Berkeley to visit me in the summer of 1982 when I was recording at Westlake. I remember that he would always wear the same red polo shirt every time I saw him. I think he was on sales calls for Ingress or something back then. This was when I was recording Thriller and it really meant a lot to me that he would come and party with me. And I think that Mike and I were under the same amount of stress back then. Most people don't know this, but Mike Stonebreaker actually wrote most of the lyrics to beat it. He was really angry at the time about Oracle or some guy named Larry. And um, we couldn't give him writing credits or anything because then that meant we would have to give royalties to the university. And Mike said he didn't want them to get anything else from him. But then I didn't see Mike for a long time because he went back to Berkeley to build Postgres and he got married or something. You know how things get. It's not like he was mad at me, you can't say that. That's ignorant. Some people ask me why I went into academia when there's so many opportunities in industry in computer science. What I tell people is that what I want most for my career is to make impact. And there are so many different opportunities that one can leverage in academia to, to make impact. To make impact through your research, through teaching, through service to your university, through advising graduate students, and also if you consult on the side, also through tech transfer. And I think this, sort of, this view I have of making impact in academia was really formed when I was a graduate student and spending time with Mike Stonebreaker at MIT. And since we're seeing Mike's tremendous impact on the entire database research community, um, and also on many different universities in the Northeast, and of course also through uh, the three companies he started while I was a PhD student. And what I think, however, is sort of the most underrated about Mike and the impact that he's had, I was actually the fourth dimension of impact that I mentioned before, the, uh, his advising of graduate students. It's, honestly, Mike has had just a, a tremendous amount of impact on me. Um, and just sort of thinking about uh, the, way, the way I approach research, the way I find problems to work on, the way, the way I sort of you know, attack a problem and sort of find ways to solve a problem, and really a lot of that comes from Mike Stonebreaker. But what's great about Mike is that his advice doesn't just stop uh, with just research. He also gives dating advice as well. When I, was, when I was a student at MIT, he told me that I needed to approach my dating life in the sort of exact same way that I approach uh, writing a single model VLDB, VLDB paper. What he said was that I need to sort of apply the same scientific rigor, the same focus and energy to my dating life as I, as I, as I do to, to writing papers. And when I graduated and moved to Yale, he told me that I wasn't going to find sort of girls to date in, in New Haven. So he told me that I needed to invest the time and, and money in an apartment in New York City and uh, spent weekends there trying to find girls to date. And indeed, actually, by the end of my first year uh, in, in New York, um, I, I, I found a, a girl today who ended up becoming my wife. So to summarize, Mike has solved both my personal and my professional problems. And without Mike, I'd probably be sad, alone, and submitting papers to pods. Happy birthday, Mike, and thanks for everything. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday to you. So again, I was, oh, sorry. I was uh, restricted from hiring anybody to, on Craigslist to appear on stage, but he never said anything about the video, so that's, <laughs> that's how I got for that. So um, 
There are some notable uh, omissions that were missing from this video. Um, we, we sent a lot of people messages and they, they respond. Uh, there were some people I want to point out, though, obviously, who could not uh, be included. Um, uh, the first is obviously uh, Gene Wong. Uh, he, his health is, is, you know, it's been better. Uh, so he sends his, his birthday wishes and he couldn't, wasn't able to, to send a video in for us. Um, we did also send a request to uh, Larry Ellison through, um, when I was out visiting Stanford, I met with Hector. Uh, Hector serves on the board of directors at Oracle, and he got me in touch with Andy Mendelson. And Andy Mendelson got in touch with Larry's personal assistant, put a request in, uh, but we got a request, uh, we got a response just this week saying that Larry would be unavailable, and that's because he is gallivanting out with his uh, undetermined age girlfriend, Nikita Khan. Um, so don't take it personally, Mike. I don't, I don't think it was you. Um, and then obviously the last person who is missing is uh, Jim Gray, because uh, we know what happened with him. Uh, so this is, was sent by Jim Gray's uh, wife. This is the last picture of Mike and Jim together uh, in, in 2006. Um, and he obviously, if he, as David DeWitt said, if he was still alive, he's still available, he definitely would be here today to celebrate with us. So, OK. Now we'll get to the quiz results. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah. All right, um, so first we're gonna go through, we're gonna go through the, the questions one by one, uh, and, you, and we'll discuss what the answers are and why those are the answers. Uh, so the first of all is, how tall is Mike? Does anyone want to take a guess? Seven two. No, <laughs> that was not one of the options, but nice try. What's, six, I heard it's six, seven, all right. The answer is he is six foot six. And I'll point out that this is actually the average height of an NBA player. Uh, I didn't put NBA player in there, but that's, that's what I meant, right? It's actually the average height is 6.69, uh, but Mike is eligible to play because uh, he is of that height. Okay, next. How many red polo shirts does Mike own? And we we'll take a guess at this. You need to consider how many shirts he has total. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us how many shirts he has total? Well, I, okay. I would venture to say 10. <laughs> we know he owns a green one. <laughs> he a green one. He had a shirt on last night. Uh, I would be very careful. I asked Beth the answer to this question, and she said uh, I, she only counted the polo shirts. So there's all these other red shirts as well that aren't technically polo shirts, and obviously he's wearing a red fleece right now, so these were not counted in it. All right, so the answer is nine. Uh, I realize some of you said one. Uh, and I thought that would be kind of rude to put that, because that would imply that he does not shower or bathe regularly. Um, but again, if you include all the other shirts, red shirts that he has, the number's in the 20s. OK, what year did Mike shave, permanently shave off his mustache? Any guesses? Not soon enough. OK. <laughs> <laughs> the peanut down in the front. So the answer is 1978. Uh, if you look at Wikipedia, this, the moment in history when he actually shaved this off is one of the darkest points uh, <laughs> in American history. We, we, this, is, uh, this is one loss we regret in the database community. Okay, how many 4,000 uh, foot mountains has Mike climbed in the state of New Hampshire? 48. Uh, that's exactly the answer, right? Yes, because the answer is 48 because it, that's all of them, right? So that's wonderful. Okay, perfect. Right, yeah. not, not entirely true. Okay. There are 4,000 footers that don't fall within the rules of the 48, and they're, they're adjacent peaks, and he's done those too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a technicality. Uh, if you put 48, we're going to go with that. You got it right. Okay. <laughs> Final questions. How many, question, how many companies has Mike co-founded? Nine. Okay, well, that, that is the answer, nine. All right. And for the record, he did not have a failed TCBY franchise. I, I made that up. Um, yeah, it was a success, yes. Uh, and of course, here's the list. Ingress, Illustra, Cohera, Streambase, Vertica, Volpe, DB, Gobi, Paradigm 4, and Data Tamer. Data Tamer was the one I think that threw people off. Okay, um, so we have a first prize here. Yeah, you really want to set up. Uh, the first prize is a handsome uh, iPhone music player thing, uh, generously donated by VoltDB, and to since we have extra stuff for people that maybe came in second place, because we do have one winner, um, we have some Vertica swag uh, that's not as nice as this, but if you're welcome to have it if you'd like. And so now, my <laughs> wonderful first year student, uh, Thomas Marshall here, who is at CMU with me, who will be in the market in four years, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
he has actually put all of the results from the contest uh, that people selected the quiz. Sit up here. Oh, you need a dongle? In ingress. <laughs> Don't ask me how I got ingress running on my MacBook. Hold up, hold up. Uh, <laughs> did a VM. <laughs> so, uh, what is your name? All right, so um, Andy made me learn Quell for this, um, but uh, I'm a little new to it, so uh, let's see if I can figure this out. Um, so the first thing that we want to see is how many people got each question correct. So something like range of S scores, let's see, retrieve, do, do, do. Q1, Q2. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, so looks like um, pretty even across. Um, question two was notably uh, worse. I guess people don't know how many shirts he owns, um, but other than that, it was common knowledge. Um, let's also see um, what the average score was. So how do we do that in Quell? All right. Ooh, 1.63. It's not very good. Uh, I guess y'all don't know Mike very well. Uh, um, and finally, who was the winner? You type in abilities without looking at the keyboard. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm pretty good at this. Um, ah, so. With a perfect 5 of 5 score, Michael Zian wins. Is he here? We have his email address. All right. I don't know who actually the person is. Is anybody now? Okay. <laughs> we have an email address. All right. Thank you, Thomas.